Exodus chapter 12 takes us back to the beginning what the disciples were celebrating with Jesus the night he instituted the Lord's Supper, that Passover meal. The Lord told Moses and Aaron this in the land of Egypt. This month is to be the beginning of your calendar. It is to be the first month of the year for you. Tell the entire Israelite community that on the tenth day of this month, they are to take a lamb or a young goat for themselves, according to their father's households, one lamb per household. But if the household is too small for a whole lamb, then that person and his neighbor next door to him must select one based on the number of people. Determine what size lamb is needed according to how much each person will eat. Your lamb must be unblemished, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the Israelite community is to slaughter the lambs at sunset. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat the lamb. That night they shall eat the meat that has been roasted over a fire, along with unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with its head, its legs, and its internal organs. You shall not leave any of it until the morning. Whatever remains until the morning, you shall burn in the fire. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, ready for travel. Your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For on that night I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike down the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you must celebrate it as a permanent regulation. That is the command of our God. Second reading from God's Word, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Jesus himself gives you this wonderful promise. You're not, you're not alone. You're united in your faith. You're united with Christ through this wonderful meal that he gives us. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a communion of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a communion of the body of Christ? Because there is one bread... We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. That's God's word. I invite you to please stand for the gospel. These verses from Mark chapter 14 will serve as the focus for our meditation. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. His disciples left and went into the city and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Amen, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and said to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It is, the one, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread with me in the dish. Indeed, the Son of Man is going to go just as it has been written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, 
they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many. Amen, I tell you. I will certainly not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It's the work of our Savior. Sunday. And Palm Sunday, how we celebrated it, at least in the, the 10 o'clock service, is we, we celebrated it by rejoicing as the children came in with those branches of palm waving about, singing a song. It was a beautiful praise to their Savior Jesus. And we rejoiced on that Palm Sunday because as the Apostle Paul laid out for us in that reading from Philippians, what our Savior Jesus did. How Jesus, the King of all kings, Lord of all lords, the creator of all things, how he humbled himself. How he took on the very nature of a servant, humbled himself to the human beings that he himself had created and became obedient even even to the point of death. We rejoiced that Jesus humbled himself to be your and my Savior. And what we do this evening, as we are now in Monday, Thursday, we rejoice in something else our Savior Jesus did. If you look at the gospel lesson that we are going to focus on, there are a lot of things in Jesus' life on that day in that reading from Mark chapter 14 that we could benefit from looking at. We could sit there and marvel at the fact on the day of the Passover when they're getting ready to celebrate it that somehow, some way, there was a room ready and not already taken up 
that Jesus and his disciples could use. We could marvel at the fact that during that meal, Jesus straight up told the disciples who his betrayer was. It kind of went over their head. That Judas was going to betray him and be the one who eventually killed him. All of those would bring, bring great benefit in our lives to look at. But because it is Monday, Thursday, we, we focus specifically on those last few verses while they were eating. Jesus took bread. When he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them. They all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many. This evening we rejoice in what Jesus just created. We rejoice in the fact that Jesus loved each and every one of his disciples there so much that he gave them this meal of his true body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine, where in that meal Jesus says, this simple eating and drinking, my 12 disciples, it is going to remove your sins. I guarantee it. It is my promise to you. It is that simple. We rejoice in the fact that Jesus created that meal and keeps it in effect to this day for you and I to participate in. The fact that he still loves us so much that when we become weighed down with sin, when we become weighed down with shame, we get to approach the altar of God and he comes to us in a very miraculous way and says through this simple eating and drinking I forgive you all your sins removed it is tonight a reason for us to rejoice because every single one of us knows the gospel truth that we need a Savior, that we need someone to remove our sins. Just three quick examples for you. Do you remember the story of Ruth? She was the daughter-in-law to a woman named Naomi. She had a sister-in-law named Orpah. What happened? Naomi's husband died, Ruth's husband died, Orpah's husband died. Naomi said, that's it, I'm going back to Israel, journeying. And they came to that fork in the road. And what did Naomi say? You girls go back. I'm not going to have any more sons for you to marry. You go back to your own people and serve your own gods. Orpah said, that sounds like a great idea. What did Naomi say? No. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Every one of us, every day, as God's children, we face that proverbial fork in the road. Where you have the opportunity to let your faith shine in this world and continue to let God's word be the guiding force in your life, saying, yes, I will walk and I will follow your path, Lord. You will be my God. And then your eyes catch something over here on that other path. And holy smokes, is it inviting? And holy smokes, is it very tempting? And what happens? Are you going to continue to walk with God? Or are you going to let your eyes lead you astray? Because this world offers all kinds of wonderful things for your pleasure that most definitely don't line up with God and his word. And the sad part is that road, walking with God, is kind of narrow and it's lonely. But that road seeking to satisfy your sinful natures, whatever it may be, it is crowded, it is packed. You will feel well accepted and you will fit in because everybody else is drinking, everybody else is popping the pills, everybody else is living that kind of lifestyle. You will be 
greatly tolerated, come on over. Will you continue to follow God or will you let your sinful nature get the better of you and walk away? Every day we're faced with that option. Show kindness to your coworker or hostility. Do as your parents tell you or rebel against them. Trust that God is in control of all things or say, nope, today I'm putting my life in my hands, my destiny. God, you got no say in it whatsoever. It is going to be me and me alone. Second example. Pharisee. Pharisee, one day he was praying in the temple, and what did he do? He said, Lord God, I thank you. I'm not like that tax collector over there. He needs a Savior. I'm a good guy, Lord God. You should be favorable toward me, God, not towards that bad, nasty man over there. That sin of I'm better than you. I'm more deserving of God's love in my life than someone else. Lord God, if two people have cancer and I am one of them, that guy over there who spends all his time at the bar, who is unfaithful with his wife and doesn't care about his children, you know which one deserves the healing, Lord? It's me. It's not, it's not him. Because we fall into that false belief that somehow we ourselves are worthy and we can earn God's love and favor that sin, that sin, that sin needs the forgiveness that we receive in the Lord's Supper. And then there's that sin of Judas. He betrayed his Savior, was bribed to hand him over to death, and then how did Judas feel? Remember how Judas felt? He was overwhelmed. He felt unloved. He felt there was no hope. He felt there was no way that God would ever love him or forgive him for what he did, betraying his son. What did Judas do? He went out and hung himself because he just said, it's done. My life is not good. No one will ever care about me ever again. He killed himself. And I pray we've never got to that point where we think suicide is our only escape. But every one of us has been plagued with those emotions of feeling absolutely like garbage, feeling completely unloved, feeling worthless and hated by everyone. No one cares about me at all. I bet you no one would even notice if I'm, if I'm gone. There's no way God would love me for the past actions that I have done. I was in the military. I killed lots of people. There's no way God can set me free from that sin, from those actions. I was unfaithful with my wife. She was kind and took me back, but there's no way God would. have. We have those sins. We have those guilts. We have those shames that just eat us up. And that's when we need Jesus. And that's when we need Jesus in this very special way where he comes to us through that body and blood, where he comes to each and every one of us in a personal way as we approach his table and he says, what? Or forgive. In this meal that Jesus created on that night, it is a new covenant, it says in there, a new testament. It is a one sided agreement. There is no work and there is no expectation on you at all. Because what did Jesus do? He said, I am doing this for you. I am going to give up my life, and now I am creating this meal. And by your simple eating, by your simple drinking, that's all it is. I am assuring you 
that my work on Calvary is yours. I am assuring you that the death I died, that the forsaking that God did to me when I endured the pains of hell are yours, your sin. and I choose the wrong path, when we go the way of Adam and Eve and say, we're going to do what we think is best, even though God, you told us it's not, Jesus comes to you and says, my dear child, in this meal, be assured, you are forgiven. When we stand there and act like holy rollers because we are not in the bar every night, we're not selling drugs, we're not cheating on our spouses, we are more deserving and better worth God's love than anybody else, God comes to you and says, no, you're not, but don't worry. Let me assure you, you are forgiven. And best of all, when we take on the emotions of Judas, when we are crushed and defeated, Jesus comes to you and says, look at how much I love you. Look at what I was willing to do for you. My dear child, you are forgiven. My dear child, you are precious to me. I forget what psalm it is, but you are the apple of of God's eye. Every single one of us is something that's flying towards your face. It's the eye. God says you are the apple of his eye. That is how precious you are. You are front and center right there to him. He will not let you go. Not ever. And now I'm going to apologize because I think, I think every Monday, Thursday I do this. The words aren't in our gospel lesson this evening. And I, I can't tell you which one they are in. There's two words that you need to remember every time you come up here for communion. Jesus says them for you. When you come up here for communion, Jesus died. Remember that for you. When he was instituting this meal on that night, he had you in mind. Every sin that you were going to do, he knew it. And he knew that you were going to need forgiveness, and he knew that you were going to be reassured over and over that you truly are forgiven. And he said, for you is this bread, for you is this wine, you are free. When he went to Calvary later on, 24 hours later or whatever it was, it was for you. He had you absolutely in mind as he was being nailed to the cross. This stinks, but it's for you. For you, I am doing this so you don't have to work, so you don't have to buy, so you don't have to suffer, so you don't have to pay for it. I am setting you free. Personally, Jesus comes to you in this meal and says, for you, I lay down my life so that you could be with me forever. That is why this evening we continue rejoicing in the journey, I don't like that, in the, the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.